And by the way, to those who think that Elminster is my uh, alter ego, I, I would like to remind people that I was clean-shaven, five years old, had thick plastic, quote unbreakable, but they're not, a glasses. Sometime around 1965, which was, by the way, a full 10 years or more before Dungeons & Dragons officially hit the scene, there was a young, lonely Canadian boy who had recently suffered the tragic loss of his mother. Needless to say, he was looking for an escape, and that escape route ended up being writing. That boy was Ed Greenwood, and that writing developed into what we know now as the Forgotten Realms. I'm Ivan with Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms Lore, we're talking less about actual Realms Lore and more about the lore surrounding the realms. This is going to be one conversation of many where we talk about the story behind the creation of the realms as well as its history. This is actually one of the very first talks Ed and I ever had, so if you want to keep up with the conversation through extended cuts, exclusive and fully narrated realms lore, participation in polls, merch, discord rules, and much more, be sure to go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood and become a legend of the realms today. So the Forgotten Realms started in 1965. So, it was not a game world created for D&D. It's about 10 years older than, than the game. And the Forgotten Realms we see today has a lot of real-world analogs in it. And although everything's drawn from what we know of the real world, I didn't like or want direct real-world analogs, but they sort of crept in over the years particularly when many, many people were working on the realms and somebody had to tell an artist in a hurry, well, it looks sort of like this. So they would reach for a, a Hollywood or a historical thing, like it's sort of like ancient Rome, only with dragons or something like that. And then the real world, world analogs would creep in. Sure. Okay, so picture a, a young boy of six who is bored, uh, lonely. My mom had just died. Um, and my solace was all the books in my father's den. So I was reading all sorts of stuff, including lots of fantasy and science fiction, um, but tons of stuff. And I was being taken places on all of these literary voyages. And I began to enjoy things, my favorites, you might call them. And one of them was the lyrical fantasy writing of Lord Dunsany. Edward Morton Drax Plunkett the Third, but you know Lord Dunsany. Oh wow, you and me. Yeah. Now, they actually started before a story. When I was like bored in kindergarten, <laughs> uh, I was really annoyed at the quality of books in the kindergarten, and I I wanted all the books in my father's den, you know, which had mighty thewed warriors and swords and and you know explosions and spaceships. And instead, I was getting one, two, three jump to boo, you know, um, so <laughs> right. I, I, and I was sitting there really bored and I had this daydream, this waking vision, a forest at night, a clearing in a forest. It's winter. There's softly falling snow, like picture postcard, Christmas postcard, gentle snow. And it's falling in a clearing. And in the background through all the trees, there are tons and tons of beast eyes watching the clearing. In the clearing is a tiny little fire that somebody, a campfire that's, that somebody has made themselves. And the somebody is a beautiful woman sitting alone with a fur cloak around her because it's, you know, winter, playing a little hand harp, something like an Irish harp. And all the creatures are listening to her music. And she has long silver hair, silver not as in old people, silver as in the metal silver right right she has long long hair and it's silver and her harping eventually brings somebody out of the woods to join her to listen uh, drawn by the music and that somebody is another woman of about the same build as in tall narrow slender tall um with metallic silver hair who looks somewhat like the first woman, but also looks a lot beefier and is wearing coat of plate armor under her fur cloak. And I didn't know who these two women were. Um, it was Storm harping and it was Dove, her sister, one of two of the seven oh, wow. sisters. 
but I didn't know who they were. I wanted to know more. I didn't know where they were. I sure. knew nothing about it. But that was the first conception of the realms because it was like, this is cool. I want to go there. I want to find out more about it. So I, as a six-year-old kid in 1965, that's where I'm starting. Now, later that same year, I start writing Fawford and Grey Mouser style stories. And the stories are on a coastal, an unnamed coast in a port city, uh, Mert the Moneylender, who was a character combined of three um, authors I'd been reading them, Shakespeare, Falstaff, Sir John Falstaff. Guy Gilpatrick wrote this series of stories about this drunken Scottish engineer on a tramp steamer, um, which was Glen Cannon. And Glen Cannon was always down in the engine room drinking Duggan's Dew of Kirk and Tillich. Um, and he was always swindling his way or trading something with local guys. And that part of Mert came from that. There was also Paul Anderson, who wrote the Pulse of Technically science fiction stories, among other things. And one of them concerned a trader called Nicholas Van Rin, who was also, you know, one of these, I can sell anything to anybody type. And so I put those three together, and that was Mert. And a typical Mert short story started with um, him having a pratfall investigation uh, escapade because he's a fat man that has food stains all down the front of him. He wheezes all the time. He can't outrun anybody. He can't outfight anybody anymore, although he used to be a mercenary captain, Mer the Merciless. But now he's an old man in floppy sea boots who has to outthink people. And by the end of each short story, he flees town. Um, just ahead of the local authorities, his enemies, or trade rivals, and the new enemies he's made during the story. So he was going from the northernmost part of the Sword Coast. He was hopscotching port city by port city south along it. I didn't know it was called the Sword Coast until 1966, a year later. I didn't know what the Sword Coast was part of until a little after that because it took him about six, seven stories to land up in Waterdeep, where he stayed. And uh, because Waterdeep was this big, sprawling, cosmopolitan city. Now, the first realm story is called One Comes Unheralded to Zerta, but that was cobbled together from fragments to become the first story. Right, because I was a young kid. I was writing little fragments. Um, and by the way, to those who think that Elminster is my uh, alter ego. I, I would like to remind people that I was clean-shaven, five years old, had thick <laughs> plastic, <laughs> quote, unbreakable, but they're not, uh, glasses. <laughs> I proved that on several occasions. Uh, I did not have a beard or long white hair, and I was not rude to people. Elminster was the sort of rude person I dreamed of being, but I was far too shy to be. Anyway, that's all in the future. It's because I started with Mert, and Mert just kept um, adventuring his way south along the Sword Coast until he ended up in Waterdeep. And everybody worshipped every god and believed in every god. So even if you only worshipped them so that they'd stay away and not cause you problems, like, I'm going on a sea voyage, I don't want to drown, so I'm going to go to the Temple of Umberley and give her an offering so she doesn't drown my ship. The rest of the time, I don't want anything to do with her. But um, right now, uh, hi, I'm your worshiper. <laughs> um, rather than one God, you know, the, that's the influence of Christianity. Uh, I, I was postulating a world in which there were many gods, and they're fallible gods. They are like the Greek and Roman gods. They're superhumans, humans with superpowers. They're not all-knowing, so any prophecy can't, necessarily be automatically true. It's a guess, or it's a way to try and nudge mortals into doing something. As a young boy who'd had his mother taken away from him, uh, his father was almost never home because he threw himself into his job, and I didn't like the schooling I was going through. I was thinking, I want a world in which I can change things. I can get what I want. So I wanted that sort of, I was telling those sort of stories. Now, the reason why they're called the Forgotten Realms 
is that it was called that to me as an observer, not to the people who live in the in in the the setting, but to me as an observer because I envisage many parallel worlds in D and D terms. You would call that alternate prime material planes. Sure, sure. Side by side worlds that are linked by magical gates, and in the early D and D setting uh, editions, we called them gates. Later, later editions called them portals. So side by side, prime material worlds, and our real world is in effect right next door to the realms. And that's why we in our real world have lots and lots of legends of dragons and wyverns and cockatrices and um, vampires. And but we don't we don't get eaten by them on our way to the supermarket every day. Um, we just have all these stories and legends. One that that's because. We used to have heavy traffic through gates, these magical portals that linked all the worlds. But now we've forgotten how to get there because these gates are ancient. Some of them have been destroyed. Some of them have had traps put on them. And there are power groups, shadowy cabals, secret societies, whatever you want to call them, operating in our worlds, a la Philip Jose Farmer's World of Tears series, um, controlling the gates and denying most of us access to them. So therefore, we have forgotten how to get to the realms, hence Forgotten Realms. Wow. Now, okay. Okay. Yeah. Michael Moorcock is usually credited with first using the term the multiverse in fiction. And maybe he did, and maybe he is the first, or maybe he isn't. But the concept, the idea, is much, much, much older. I first in encountered it in a book called The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris, yeah. published in 1894. Yeah. And if, you, if you've if you ever read The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples Lewis, uh, he borrowed the idea for Narnia, and he called it, as I did when I used it in the realms, The Wood Between the Worlds. And the idea was that you had this ancient sprawling wood and that all sorts of prime material planes had gates that opened into the wood. So if you if you were in the wood and you stepped across a pond in a particular direction, you'd be swallowed by a gate instead of splashing into the water. If you stepped between two trees when the moonlight was falling upon those parts of the trees, you were taken to another world instead of just arriving on the other side of those two trees. Anyway, that's how Forgotten Realms came from. TSR loved the name, but they downplayed the reason behind it because... We were in the middle of the satanic panic, and they wanted to avoid a lot of lawsuits that might arise from people in the real world trying to find and pass through imaginary gates and getting hurt. So only the name survived. I also wanted some happy-go-lucky adventuring, which is why I'm starting with Mert, the rogue, you know, the, the happy rogue, the happy warrior, um, because that is what I needed in my own life at that time. I wanted to know that there's this get up and go and just keep going and this carefree life has handed me um dung i'm gonna make yep yeah pudding out of it and keep going you know sort of thing <laughs> that i needed <laughs> that's, that's the first time i heard that one <laughs> uh, but yeah the role-playing <laughs> industry as we know it and D D don't exist yet i'm just writing for my own entertainment right i'm right. not caring about you know, what is cool. These aren't supposed to be improving stories other than sometimes good wins. Sometimes the impossible happens. Um, sometimes the ragtag bunch of good guys beats the big dark lord. You know, and uh, but now it's a cliche because everybody's done it. Yeah. What is one thing that you think is a common misconception? Maybe something that you think people get wrong about the realms um, that whether that be because the extent of their knowledge is just the last thing that they read or maybe it's because they haven't had the same exposure or they don't have access to your brain right <laughs> what's something that you think is a misconception or something that people get wrong i i think the two misconceptions would be that it's a series of direct real, steals from the real world or real world history and that it's it, the gods run everything and in a in a good realms campaign your characters run everything except then the dungeon master has to guard against the 
characters being the movers and shakers and the, yeah, yeah. the stage is full of lifeless NPCs until the characters walk on. The, everybody around the characters should be doing stuff. They should all have lives. They should all be, uh, you know, if, if you're in a small village, everybody in the small village is doing stuff. If the, if the player characters go away for um, a month, two months, stuff should happen while they're gone. Being able to provide players with agency by saying what you do in this world matters, but also there are things in this world that matter beyond you is is a really powerful message. And I think all role players could really benefit from from that advice. So thank you for that. Mm, no problem. Yeah. If we're publishing the main publish realms, we're trying to keep a consistent world going. We're trying to give you a whole picture that makes sense. Because if we don't, then it cheapens everything you adventure for. Uh, if we change the origin of this king and and you thought you knew something and we've just willy-nilly changed it, then then it's we've diminished that what which you are adventuring in. We've made it seem less real. And with that said, we have to be consistent, but you can focus on anything you want in the realms. If you want a campaign about people planting gardens to re-green the world and not have any violence, and orcs are your friends and you learn from them, do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Make the realms yours. I learned to write by reading books or stories, some, some book length, some not, that I loved, and then running upstairs to my father and saying, uh, uh, Dad, Dad, this was great. And this was usually a source of embarrassment to him because he <laughs> usually had, well, he had a room full of NATO generals or something. And 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 sure, I'd be sure. waving, I well, and I'd be waving Aulhu Trail. She was staked out nude in the sun to die, or something. You know, a wartime lurid <laughs> paperback. I I'd be waving it in his face and saying, "Dad, Dad, this is great. What's the next one?" So he'd usually get rid of me by saying, "So, well, son, <laughs> if if you want to read another one, uh, those you're going to have to write it yourself." Because that author died in 1934, and I go, "Oh, okay." And I go running back down the stairs to the den where all the books were. And my Aunt Clara, who is...